Okay. Um, on behalf of myself, I would like to introduce myself, who's giving a talk on that. <laughs> okay, this is who I am. This is where I work. This is the Science DMZ. Um, now, before I get started, uh, who here, I, you don't have to answer this question if it's too personal, who here self-identifies as a security person? I see Mr. Romero there, I know. Yeah, there's Vaughn, okay. Wait, only two people right in the come on. Some more people, there are more security people. There's a few of us, good, I like that. I'm kind of like that too. Uh, you can spell security, that's good enough, yeah, okay. Um, and how many people identify sort of as network people? Network people are most of us. Um, and if you maybe identify more as like kind of a cyber infrastructure research support person, you can also identify that way too. I saw Chris Hoffman, but then he left, so anyway. Okay, cool. Um, you know, the, most of you know what the regular Science DMZ looks like. This slide, of course, is stolen from Eli. By the way, Eli and I, our offices are right next to each other, so we did call each other both on the outfits. That's why we're wearing the same thing, and also um, on, we sort of tried to coordinate these presentations a little bit. I'm talking about Science DMZ security, and I often get the question asked, how do I secure a Science DMZ? And part of my answer to the question is, I would like you to ask a different question. The question I would like you to ask is, how do I use the Science DMZ to make my campus or my network or my lab or whatever it is that I run, make that security better? How do I use the Science DMZ to improve my overall security posture? The Science DMZ is something that needs to be controlled, but it also is a control. And I'm going to examine that aspect of it. Um, if you think about a complicated firewall like a Palo Alto, it is also a control, obviously, but you need to patch it. You need to make sure people can't get into it. You need to authenticate, have good authentication, two-factor maybe. You need to protect it as well. So there are controls, and there are controls that need to be controlled. I'm going to look at the other side of that. I'm going to look at how the Science DMZ is itself a control. Now, the research people, the network engineers, they view the science DMZ as this great liberating force. This is Bastille Day, okay? This is, we've finally been freed of the shackles of those evil security people, you know who I'm pointing at. We've finally been freed, we can do whatever we want on the network now. It is a network without firewalls. Of course, security people look at it a little bit differently. They look at it as the Wild West. And I was trying to find a picture that depicted the Wild West, and then I stumbled on Yosemite Sam, and I realized actually Yosemite Sam is perfect because Yosemite Sam is not just the Wild West. He's a really bumbling, incompetent version of the Wild West, which is kind of how security people might look at a science DMZ. You've got scientists and network people trying to run something that they're calling a DMZ, how is this gonna work? And the reality is, it's, I think this is a CT scanner, it's an instrument, it's a thing, it's a tool. It's a tool that can be used by both the security folks and the network and research folks. And I really do think that it is incumbent on all of us whether we are security people, whether we are network people, whether we are scientists or research people, to be part of the conversation. And now that Kevin has just walked back in the room, I wanna point out that I, one of the things that I think the CC grants did really, really well was to get the scientists and the infrastructure people talking. Um, not, and giving people money helps. <laughs> yeah, let's, okay, there's money, let's talk about it. Um, but getting people talking, getting that conversation going. When we talk about science DMZ security, what it means is the security people need to be part of that conversation now as well. Now that we have campuses that are ramping up research computing support groups, now that we have campuses that are engaging, doing actual science engagement, we need to have the security engagement as well. We need to have the security folks involved from day one. I know they want to be because we all know security is better when you bolt, when you Build it in, not bolt it on. So if you can involve the security people from the beginning, understand what the tool is and what it does, 
both from a security perspective and from a network performance perspective. That's really the question, and that's really the conversation you want to be having. Um, I've stolen this slide from Eli. Um, I'm going to try to remember all the ones I stole from him. We know that, and I would also just call it just plain old functionality. In data intensive science, a big part of the network function is high performance. The network doesn't perform, it doesn't do its job. I think Eli made that point pretty emphatically in the previous talk, but it is part of the equation. If you can't maximize the function while also managing the security trade-off, then you're not able to let the network do its job. And if it's not doing its job, then well, we might as well turn it off. So we need to make sure that we understand the core function of what we're trying to do, and that is a performant network for data intensive science. So performance is an important key here. A lot of what we do, unfortunately, through no fault of our own, and not even, believe it or not, through any fault of our security officers, you know, it's hard to believe, but no, they are, they are trying to do manage the same trade-offs that we're trying to manage, um, is we are often trying to kind of catch up, play a catch-up game with checkbox compliance. A lot of what we're trying to do in networking and in security is make sure that we've checked off all the boxes. A lot of network security standards out there are involve kind of compliance, whether it's PCI DSS or some of the FISMA requirements or some of the NIST requirements. Um, there's a lot of different kind of top-down checkbox compliance. What we need to do is fundamentally reassess what are the things of value that sit on our network, what are the risks that they're exposed to, and how do we control that? And the idea is that more controls don't necessarily mean more security. The right controls, however, do go a long way toward better security. So one of the things that we talk about, again, going back to the Bastille Day ideas, you know, taking the science DMZ, and we're getting around security controls. No, we are tailoring the right security controls for the right set of risks. So if you think that the science DMZ was designed to get around firewalls, and in many cases, we do advocate that science DMZs are not put behind stateful firewalls or deep packet inspection devices in line. You can still have those devices offline, but not in line. But that is not the only goal of the science DMZ. Not the only goal of the science DMZ is to get performant devices in place. One of the things we want to do is reduce degrees of freedom or put differently, things that you have to troubleshoot when stuff goes wrong. So if you believe that Science DMZ is just about getting around firewalls, lots of people will say, oh yeah, we have our whole network to Science DMZ because it's not behind a firewall. That might be a science network or a research network, but that's not really a Science DMZ. You know, the old Science DMZ, the original Science DMZ model that I showed you had the Science DMZ closely attached to the border router topologically and even physically, because if you're physically far away from the border router, you've got things like fiber patch panels that could get dirty and things like that. There's more stuff to troubleshoot. We're just trying to reduce the things you have to troubleshoot and the things that can impede network performance. I call that degrees of freedom, but you, know, you can call it whatever you want, stuff you have to troubleshoot. Um, so the idea that we have to have default permit or there are no security controls on a science DMZ, that's something that I hope to dispel very quickly. Part of the reason for that is you could replace the word firewall with network here too. I mean, we all know as network engineers and we all know as security people, whatever we have control over is the thing that's always guilty until proven innocent. If you're a security person, you know everyone's blaming the firewall. If you're a network person, everyone's blaming the network. If you're not a security or a network person, it's whatever it is out there, I don't know, but it's not mine. It's their fault. And Part of the problem with firewalls is even when you do prove it innocent, you still spent two and a half hours proving it innocent. So it is something you still have to troubleshoot. Um, just like having lots of network switches in between your science DMZ and your border router, or just have, having lots of administrative domains between different networks, you're going to have to spend time troubleshooting all that stuff. So the more we can simplify the path, the better off we're gonna be. So, 
I already talked about this slide. <clears throat> I want to talk about how we drive network security in a world with science DMZs using risk and using good risk assessment. When I say good risk assessment, I don't mean perfect risk assessment. I also don't mean risk assessment that we use to create a risk register and throw away or put in a file somewhere and say, yes, we did this, and it sits on Google Drive and it has a date of 2014 and we don't look at it again. I'm really saying think about what is valuable on our network and what do we need to protect and how do we need to protect those different things. The important thing to understand about risk, people often come up to me and say, well, you know, the risk is really high, but the likelihood is low. No, the impact is really high but the likelihood is low. That means the risk is somewhere as a multiplier of those things or as a, a function of those two things. You need to include risk and you need to include impact and likelihood in your assessment of risk. And it has to be over a bounded time horizon because if the probability of something happening is non-zero and your time horizon is infinite, by definition, it will happen. So you need to make sure that you bound your time horizon. Now, a lot of people ask me, Mike, how do you bound your time horizon? What is your time horizon for this? And my time horizon is about 10 or 12 years. I wanna see what's the likelihood of something happening over the next 10 or 12 years, because after that, I'm planning to retire and open up a distillery, and I will not be bothered with this anymore. Um, and by the way, um, yes, that security officer retired a few months ago, and I said, you're not doing any more risk assessment because your time horizon is like two months. So. I told her she couldn't do any risk assessment after that. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do risk-based security? In the ideal form of risk-based security, you identify the risks, you identify and create controls that are tailored to that risk, think about how this relates to the science DMZ, and you apply those controls as necessary. Control-based security, you get a list of controls, you apply them. The more controls you apply, the more security you have. Okay, there you go. Um, most security people, if you ask security consultants, they love risk-based security because risk-based security sounds right. Um, you know, they even have sarcastic remarks this, uh, because the standard says, so that was actually a direct quote from some security consultant who said, this is what, what control-based security is. It just, you just do it because it says so. Rather dismissive tone. And that's what a lot of security people have toward control-based security. And yet, we practice control-based security a lot partly because we have to, and partly because risk is hard. Most important hard thing is, how do we determine if we've actually mitigate the risk? I mean, trying to estimate the likelihood of said data set getting hacked. And what does it mean to get hacked? Does it mean that somebody, an authorized person sees it, an authorized person modifies it? Is it fraud, is it outright fraud? What is it when we talk about getting hacked? So we have to understand that too. But it turns out that it's hard enough to estimate the likelihood it's also really hard to estimate the like, how that likelihood changes based on the controls that you put in. And you can also you know, manage the impact as well. For example, eliminating PII in various data sets. That reduces your impact. So that's a really good way, especially in, in kind of a science DMZ context to try to control risk. But what if you're just trying to reduce likelihoods? Okay, how do you know you've done it? Um, uh, a guy in Microsoft Research who does a lot of sort of economic analysis or rational actor analysis of security, uh, whose name I forgot, and I should put this in here, it just says Microsoft Research paper. Unfortunately, I forgot his name, but um, I'll put that in the next version of the slide so when I send them out to you so you don't have to take pictures of them, you'll get them. Uh, he has a really Irish name. Um, <laughs> Basically, what he says is, you know, you can't say, it's a dog that didn't bark. You can't say, I fixed this and it didn't happen. Um, you know, if you, if you talk to people who understand the arms race and the Cold War, we didn't have a nuclear war, therefore deterrence worked. Well, did it or did we just, I don't know, are we just lucky? Um, that's one thing we have to understand. So in the early days of firewalls, you remember how people used to log every event on the firewall and then they'd cat all the week's logs together and do WC minus L and say, that's how many firewall, that's how many intrusions we prevented. Every, every time that firewall logs something, it must have been something bad happening, and that's how many attacks we prevented. So there's our ROI on the firewall. I've actually seen people do this, um, and there's a lot of nodding heads out there. Um, another thing about risk security that's hard is, you know, it's very labor intensive. Um, you've got things like unknown unknowns. Not only are things like likelihoods unknown, unknown, but you might not have impacts that you fully understand. 
you might not know that someone out there is trying to get a particular data set or is trying to fake a particular data set or fraudulently change a particular data set. And the most important thing is if you have well-known controls in place, you're not going to get in trouble if you're a security person. Um, if the firewall is there and the firewall was configured reasonably, like it wasn't permit all all, which I've actually seen on firewalls, doing a great job of routing really slowly, um, then you know basically you're not going to get in trouble. You've got you've got cover at this point. The thing that's difficult not just with risk, but also with control-based security, is that when we work at a research lab in an r and &E network or at a university, the risks that we have in the different parts of those networks vary demonstrably over the, the different parts. I mean, think about your res hall network and the network where all the grades are kept, the administrative systems that take in the tuition and spit out the various things like payroll and other stuff. Um, those have very different risks than the research area. And within research areas, there obviously may be different risks. You may have regulatory frameworks over certain types of data, like HIPAA data. You may have um, data that is in some way uh, intellectual property or um, you know, some amount of research that you want to keep confidential until it gets published. But then once it gets published, you want all the data to be available. So things may change over time. Things may change across the network. But in a way, isn't that actually an argument against control-based security? If you have one giant firewall in the middle of your network, how do you manage all of these different security policies? How do you manage all of the different controls that need to be applied to all the different functions and risk profiles of the various networks? And again, that's the thing we're trying to maximize. Maximize function, minimize risk. That's the trade-off we're trying to manage. Um, this is another Eli slide. Basically, what he's saying here is the types of data, even in the science DMZ context, the types of data you have carry with them different risks. So how do we fix this? Um, you hear a lot about network segmentation. And in fact, in one of these slides, I even mentioned, it may be this one or maybe the next one, I mentioned zero trust. So this is really getting buzzword compliant here. <laughs> but in reality, this is stuff we've been doing for a long time, partly because, for example, segmentation. All of us, if you take credit cards or if you have a network that might have proprietary or classified information on it, you do segmentation because you don't want to apply those really expensive hard controls like PCI DSS controls to your entire network. So you are already doing segmentation. You are already saying, my PCI environment is this big, because if I put this in it, then that goes in it, and then all, all of a sudden it starts expanding, and your costs go way up, and the, the amount of stuff you have to do for that network goes way up. So you try to keep these things small and segmented. And that's also true of other types of uh, restricted data. So the science DMZ is really the same concept. It's something we've been doing for a long time. And by the way, we and RE have been doing zero trust for a long time too. You know, this is something that we, you know, is more of an RE thing than anything else because we've been one of the very natures of RE is to collaborate. You know, we have collaborations that are going across administrative boundaries. We have um, people within our network that we may not actually trust. So the idea of having a, you know, the idea that a perimeter is somehow the difference between trust and untrust, we long ago kind of gave up on that one because we had to. And now that industry is picking it up, it's great. It means that they're now tailoring solutions that we can pick up a little more easily. But it does mean that this is not something that should be hugely unfamiliar. We are taking a model and extending it. So, so for example, you can take more granular trust by having the science DMZ. Think about this exercise, okay? You have a data set inside your campus that has to be made available to everyone. What do you think, as a security person, put a security hat on for a second, take that, poke a big hole in the middle of your firewall and say, anyone can get to this computer over here. Or do you take that computer outside the perimeter, stick it on its own network, put some controls on it, for that computer 
and then take the one application that needs to serve out the data, let that go to the whole world, and not have it inside your network, and not have it trusted by the inside of your network. In other words, when you start down this path of taking out the public parts of the network, pulling them out, putting them into their own enclaves, giving them their own controls, now you're actually improving the security of the rest of your network because you can lock it down harder. This is the conversation we should be having. It's not that we're taking away controls. It's that we are tailoring the controls to the thing we're doing. And by making those controls more tailored to the thing we're doing, we improve functionality and we improve security. I will talk about firewalls for a second. Some of you have seen this before. Again, this is, this is an Eli thing, but I, I thought I would throw it in here because I think it's, it's useful to think about how firewalls work. And there are different firewalls that work different ways. And if you can configure firewalls to do things differently, they will work differently. Um, and I mean the internals will work differently, not just the thing you're configuring it to do. So in a lot of cases, firewalls have a distributed processing engine. That's in order to be able to do things like deep packet inspection. Um, some firewalls have the capability of taking a relatively simple stateful rule matching a flow on that stateful rule, converting it into stateless rules, dumping the stateless rules into ASICs, and then forwarding them at line rate. So you have one or two packets, or the handshake, that is a stateful rule, and then all of a sudden it becomes a stateless rule and it looks just like a router ACL from the perspective of the internals of that firewall. But if you do something like have a firewall that's doing deep packet inspection, oftentimes what it's doing is a distributed processing type thing. Now, in this particular case, what we've done is we've said, these are three different buildings. The one building has 10 gig, the other building has 10 gig, but the middle building has a whole bunch of 10 by ones, or a 10 by one lag, essentially. And if you think about how that works, um, you basically put a one gig bottleneck in the middle of your 10 gig network. Firewalls work the same way if you are doing the kinds of deep packet inspection and other things that require distributed processing. Now, you could buy a really expensive firewall that can do 100 gig, but a lot of the internals there are still 10 gig. So you can basically pay a lot of money to multiply those numbers by 10. But that's about it. It's about the best performance you're going to get if you're doing the deep packet inspection kind of stuff in line. You can do it out of line, but not necessarily in line. Um, I love state tables because state tables, again, remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to reduce troubleshooting. Anything that requires us to maintain state is going to be hard to troubleshoot. My favorite story about this is uh, large chunks of the data center network at UC Berkeley went down for about three days. and. I didn't have to troubleshoot it because I was on the beach in Kauai. <laughs> uh, and it was, actually, I did a little bit of troubleshooting because the wireless in the house that we had rented um, reached out to the beach. So you could actually have your laptop on the beach or your um, tablet, and you could be reading email. Um, I started to just to pretend that didn't work anymore because I didn't want to keep doing that. <clears throat> um, it turns out what was happening with that is a case of the firewall was configured to keep states forever, um, which is always nice. Um, there were timeouts on UDP states, but on TCP states, they were configured to keep it forever because, well, you're eventually going to see the TCP connection gets reset or it, gets, it has a fin, so it ends at some point. The firewall can clear that out of its state. Um, there was an interaction between a set of uh, computers that had an operating system that were made in Washington state and there was a, um, one of them was a server, and it was an older version of this server, and it wasn't properly closing, or at least to the at least to the firewalls liking, it wasn't properly closing the TCP connection. State table overflows, and then when state tables overflow, it's always great. You've got high availability firewalls, right? Just clear the state table or reboot the firewall. Your state table's been synchronized to your high availability pair. So then when the new firewall comes up, all that state comes back, 
and there it is again. So what you have to do is turn the entire network off, both firewalls get shut off, take a deep breath, have a glass of water, turn them back on, lo and behold the network works and you have no idea why. Um, it actually turns out when I came back, um, my boss had insisted that it wasn't the fault of that one operating system in um, in Washington, and I said, uh, uh, guess what I just found? I looked at, uh, at our NetFlow data, and I looked at um, the firewall state table data, and uh, <laughs> guess what? You were wrong. Famous last words. Um, but it leads you to have really complex and really interesting troubleshooting stories that you can tell when you interview for your next job. Just saying that from experience also. OK. How do firewalls do with science traffic? Um, depending on how you configure the firewall, they can do pretty badly. So I said, remember I said I wasn't going to concentrate too much on firewalls. I'm concentrating a little bit on firewalls because I do want to give you the idea that we need to think differently about how we put controls on, and we need to think differently about how we handle the packet filtering function. Here you can see cases where we had a firewall and the green line is really the relevant line here. The green line on the top is, these are just perks on our tests, but they could actually be data throughput because we can do data throughput as fast as we can do perks on our tests now. And you can basically see we go from nothing because of a firewall that is basically churning away at every packet. It's looking at every packet as it goes through. And when we fix that, you can see that the performance improves pretty dramatically. So if we can't use firewalls, or if firewalls give us the trouble, how do we try to make the science DMZ work without it? Most important thing is to contain risk. And that means holding the line. That means that the, the mean old security people, Mr. Romero, Mr. Welch, people like you, need to say, hey, you know, the science DMZ is not the Wild West. Not just that you need to say that, the network people need to say, we agree, okay? We, when a professor says, and we've actually had this happen, Eli and I have been on email threads where we've had this happen where people say, we wanna put a, a listserv in our science DMZ. Why? Well, because it's kinda of hard to use the campus mail server. They use Google Groups and there's some stuff we wanna do a little bit differently and blah, 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 blah. No. That's not what the Science DMZ does. The Science DMZ is designed for high performance networking, not for letting you run a mailing list, or not for letting you do whatever you want. Maybe you could have a mailing list DMZ at some point. You know, maybe that works. I don't think it scales, but you have to be careful about those sorts of things and you have to be willing to hold the line. Um, yeah, don't put chat servers in either. We've had that also. XMPP servers, they can go somewhere else, or you know, put them in AWS, whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, no, right, exactly. Just a loud buzzer, you know, just push the buzzer. Um, so the more you can keep that application suite simple, the easier it is to build a highly controlled but firewallless network. And a lot of people say, oh, but you know, with the Science DMZ, you can't do default deny, can you? You can't have a default deny policy with a science DMZ. It has to be completely open. No, and this slide proves it, because the title says so. You absolutely can do default deny. You absolutely should do default deny in your science DMZ. I, and, I, and I wouldn't be saying this so emphatically if people, if security officers hadn't come to me and said, but you can't do default deny in a science DMZ. No, you must do default deny in a science DMZ. You are supposed to do default deny in a science DMZ. This is easier because you've limited the applications that you're putting in here. So even if it's a data set you have to be making available to the world, you can still close off all those other application ports. You don't need to make SSH open to the world because no one else is going to SSH to it. And that, that actually improves the situation of rsync over SSH. It prevents people from trying to copy your data set by SSH. Block it and only allow something like Globus, or only allow something like XRD, or one of those kinds of um, grid FTP, one of those kinds of applications. 
It also means it's easier to do stateless rules. And if you can do stateless rules, you can either do really simple stateless rules that you can use a, a firewall that converts them into stateless rules. I believe the Juniper SRX platform, some versions of it will do that, but I'm not recommending any particular platform. Just saying I know that that's one that will do it. There are probably others. Um, if you can do that, then you can, um, you can get line rate performance. But you can also get line rate performance if you can create stateless rules. And by simplifying the applications that are in your science DMZ, then you can create stateless rules that are super restrictive, but also extremely performant. So these are default denied. The idea here is you take ACLs and you create default deny policy, and you create it in a stateless way, and you can really lock down that particular network. But it comes from limiting the applications, isolating the risk, and moving that stuff out from behind the stuff you really want to secure. You don't want a world, you know, world readable data set to have to sit inside your business network. Absolutely firewall that off, close it off, deep packet inspection, audit. So all of that stuff can happen if you take that stuff out and put it in its own enclave. Now, there's also a, an idea that um, we're certainly not ignoring firewalls, and we're certainly not um, uh, ignoring security. But there's also an idea that maybe we can have a firewall in place, and we can use SDN or something like that to route around it. Um, this may someday work really well, but I think my, my concern with that is that you end up with a lot of complexity. There are a lot of good things that SDN does. Um, we just had some fun with our Google peering recently. They did some really clever SDN stuff and routed some of our traffic into a from our 10 gig peering to our 100 gig peering, which I thought was really neat. And I can tell you about that later. There's a lot of cool things that SDN does, but I would be a little bit careful about layering it on top of a science DMZ if you can get the same bang for your buck by doing stateless rules. Because again, you're adding complexity, you're layering complexity on top. Um, I like to say these are things you can just read later or take a picture of and read now. Um, I, I like the idea of implementing IPv6 on your science DMZ if you haven't done IPv6 yet. If you're involved in any of the LHC experiments, um, they are definitely pushing IPv6 pretty hard now. Okay, the WLCG, I always get that acronym wrong, WLCG is, is essentially requiring IPv6. So for those of us who are, who are setting up peerings on LHC1, we're having to implement IPv6. We're getting a lot of emails from universities, hey, can we turn up IPv6 on our peering now? This is something that is happening. You know, when I was saying years ago, if you're not doing IPv6, your science collaborations might start making you do that soon. It's happening now. Not saying I told you so, but I did. OK. You can also do, um, some people were talking earlier today. I was having a meeting with some folks from the Philippines. They were talking about static routing. You can limit the routing inbound and outbound on your science DMZ, again, because you are limiting the applications and you were limiting the stuff that's in there, you can make it so that it only talks to the people you want the science CMZ to talk to. This is so the principle between BP. This is the principle behind overlay networks like LHC1. You can also do, I mean, yes, you can do route filters, uh, static routes. So you can basically say, I only want these routes to be let in. Um, you can have a BGP session like that. Uh, you could also have a, a VRF or an overlay network. No default route, because once you have the default route, then yeah, all the traffic's going everywhere. But that's one that's one additional control you can put on. Also outbound ACLs. Again, because of the way we are segmenting the network, it lets us do more. How many people have outbound ACLs beyond just a bunch of minimal ones on their enterprise network? Mark does? Okay. Um, this lets you put outbound ACLs and let, lets you really lock them down. So again, this is something else. Um, I'm going to, oh wait, is it really only 256? Jeez, OK. 
feels like I've been talking forever. Um, I'm still going to speed up just because I'm losing my voice. And uh, I think my flow max just kicked in and I've been drinking a lot of water anyway. Um, so a couple things. If you have, you know, the data is important. The risk to the data is important. What if you have sensitive or restricted data? Uh, I've given this scenario in the past, so I'm not going to repeat it here because I actually gave it at Scenic in, in 2015, some of the things you can do about encrypting data. I really do like encryption as much as I say that security protocols are hard. I do like encryption because what encryption lets you do is you can have things like something that generates the data, like an instrument, and something in line that encrypts it onto the file system that it's trying to be written to. Then you can mount that file system as a shared file system with your DTN and ship the data out. That's assuming that the thing's not generating so much data so quickly that the encryption stuff can't keep up with it. If you've got that problem, that may not be easily solvable. Um, you may need to cook the data down before you encrypt it. But that's something to think about too. But having shared file systems, or if you're really paranoid, the way to do it is you have a, a science instrument that generates the data, sticks it on a LUN. You have a machine that comes back and encrypts the data on that LUN, puts it on a different LUN, unmounts the LUN, lets the DTN mount it, and then you ship it out. Um, that is a lot of work. That's complicated. But the thing that you're maximizing there is the outbound data transfer. So although you're doing a lot of work to secure the data first, you're maximizing the outbound data transfer, which means that the one thing you're not going to have to troubleshoot, hopefully, is that outbound data transfer. You might troubleshoot some of the other things in there. But those are all things that, you know, you can, depending on how much you want to contain that risk and how much you need to contain that risk, those are all things you can do. Um, the other thing you can do and Eli has written a paper on medical science DMZs. The portal that Eli described earlier, uh, you can do, um, you can use that for restricted data, and I'll explain a little bit later about how that works. Somebody asked me earlier, um, if you're not doing firewalls, can you still audit what's going on? Can you still find out who's using your science DMZ? And that's absolutely true. In fact, it's something you really should be doing. So if you, again, you're not putting stuff in line. But what you are doing is using tools like Bro and Suricata, or now Zeek and Suricata, and creating logs and audit lists of what's happening on your network. And if you understand a little bit about Zeek, I think most people here have heard of it. Anyone who hasn't heard of Bro? I was in Europe giving a talk. Nobody had heard of it. So I was like, oh, I got to back up here and talk about this. And then I'm going to call up Greg Bell at Coralite and make him buy me a beer because I just sold his product to a whole bunch of uh, to a whole bunch of Europeans. Um, so you pretty much know what Zeek is. You pretty much know how to use it. The good thing about Zeek is that it does scale fairly linearly, so you can actually cluster it in such a way that, and this is the stuff that LBL has written a paper on a few years ago. You can actually run it at 100 gig line rate. Um, it does require a lot of resources to do that, but you can do it. Okay, and now there are products based on that that our friend Greg um, um, uh, sells to you. So um, I won't get too much into this. A lot of people say, oh, should I run Bro or Soricata? Why not both? Okay. Um, this is not a case where you have to, you're not you're running these in line, so you're not affecting performance. You can actually run both. I would advise you to only run both if you can make good use of the data they're producing. If you're just going to run both and not do anything with them, then you're probably just adding complexity. But if you can make good use of the data, then running both is actually a good thing. And if you have, if it's, if you're like a big university, you probably have people who know, or even a relatively small university, you probably have people who know both. So you can probably, you know, get away with it. So I want to go back to the portal for a second. And you've heard all this from Eli. So I think I can actually skip most of this stuff because I think this is all Eli stuff. But there's one modified version of Eli's slide that I want to show. And there's one thing I want to emphasize about how the portal not just increases performance or helps performance and functionality, but it actually helps with security. What this slide shows is the security controls that you can apply to the DTN, so both the host-based firewalls and the ACLs here on the DTNs, 
and security controls on the file system and the security controls, including the big firewall, you can put in front of the portal server. Because we have separated the data search and curation capability from the actual transfer capability, okay, we can apply different security controls to those different sub-functions. Now think about what we've just done. We're not just segmenting the network. We're not just segmenting this application and that application. We are separating the individual functions of each application. So we're now able to segment the application itself. So we take the control plane of the data application, separate it from the data plane. Since a lot of us are networking people, we know what that means. That's what we've been trying to do for years with MPLS and SDN, OpenFlow, all those things. Separate the control plane from the data plane. We're doing this with an application now. We're separating the control plane from the data plane. And we are applying different security controls to the different subparts of the application. This is the science DMZ model writ large. This is the science DMZ model on steroids, if you will. Um, if you can do this, and really this isn't that hard because this, as Eli pointed out, the CDN people have already led the way here. Now we can apply completely different controls to parts of the same application and get maximized security and maximized functionality. I think this can be very powerful. Yeah. Right. Right. So if folks didn't hear that. Um, essentially, it's you know when you use the word science DMZ, are you talking about all of science, or are we talking about? A tool, and this is great, thank you so much for doing this, because we'll go on to my conclusion here, which is the Science DMZ is a tool that lends itself to a more broad network segmentation-based approach to security. It allows you to fit in, as uh, Peter right mentioned, um, as Peter mentioned, it allows you to fit, you know, you've got students, you've got research data, you've got different types of science, different types of data, which all carry different types of risk. You don't have one DMZ for all of science. Instead, what you do is you have different science DMZs or different DMZs for different applications, for different risk profiles. And if you can do that, and I argue that this is kind of what we need to do now, then the science DMZ becomes part of your toolkit for security. Far from being something that you need to control, it becomes something that is a control. It becomes something that is part of your security arsenal. And that's the conversation we should be having, and that's the way we should be looking at it, because that's what's going to allow all of us to converge on a common solution that, again, does what we want to do, which is maximize the functionality while minimizing the risk. It's all about trade-offs. Thanks. This is great. I had no moderator to tell me I was running long. So I don't know if I'm running long or not. It's 305. Oh, Questions? Yes. Vaughn, um, does anyone have the microphone? Or, oh, no, it's way over here. <laughs> OK. Vaughn Welch? Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Good talk. Um, I think Cormac Hurley was the researcher you were trying to remember. I like the way you put almost all this. One suggestion, you talk about function. I think you can actually go higher in the political stack and talk about organizational mission. Uh, and there is no you. university's wish, mission on their website that I've yet to find that does not include science and or research. And so what you're talking about here is really having the network support all aspects of that university's mission well. And you can, you can go up that high to make the, this argument. But I think the segmentation uh, should speak well to the, the security audience on that. Uh, one kind of minor question I had for you, you very quickly went over the point about risk analysis and being costlier upfront and then maybe paying it for itself in the long term. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that. 
Yeah, I think that, um, so I, I'm reminded of um, an economist who just died a couple of years ago named Albert O. Hirschman. Albert O. Hirschman had a, uh, an argument that he called not the invisible hand, but the hiding hand. What the hiding hand does is it blinds us to certain upfront costs that ultimately make us have, make us better off in the future, in the long run. And he gives us an example about boring a tunnel through a mountain in Massachusetts. It turned out it was much more expensive, much harder to do um, than they realized when they started. But because they'd already started, they just kept going. And years later, they finally bored this tunnel through. It completely changed the economy of Massachusetts, of Western Massachusetts in particular. Now, why, how does that, what does that have to do with risk? Well, part of what I think our problem is with risk is that there's sort of an anti-invisible hand. In other words, we see the cost of doing this. Oh, this is hard. There's a hump we have to get over. Um, in order to do the risk assessment, we've got to do some real work. Whereas if we just took this list of controls and just plugged them in, or if we just stuck a big firewall in front of it, configured a bunch of rules and let it go, mission accomplished, right? So we're done. We've done, this, we've done the security stuff we need to do. Not that anyone here who does security does that or is under any pressure to do that. Um, you may, but you may, you know, we may have end up, ended up falling into that trap sometimes where we said, let's just put a bunch of controls on it. And from the security person's perspective, I've heard lots of security people come to me and say, my business people or my student people or my, you know, people that design this application that is a piece of crap. And then they came to me after it was done and said, okay, Mr. Security Officer, secure this. Well, yeah, what are you going to do but pile a bunch of controls on that? Because there's no way necessarily to really understand how the application is put together. You've not been given that opportunity to do that. So you'd have to really sort of take the application back apart, figure out what it does, put it back together again, understand what the risks are and how you have to control them. Once you do that, you have an application that's arguably, arguably a lot more secure and it's gonna stay more secure than the one where you just piled controls on it. And if you think about um, you know, whether it's Science DMZ or whether it's uh, some other application that requires really good security, there's a cost up front, but if you can tune your security controls, and that means maybe applying harsher controls to parts of your network than you would if you didn't do the segmentation kind of stuff. But if you can tune those controls to risk, in the long run, you're gonna have a more secure network. And when I say it saves money in the long run, what that means is you're not cleaning up messes because somebody compromised something. You're not spending money notifying people because somebody compromised something. Um, Tad, thanks. Yeah, um, pardon me. So with respect to segmentation, how do you manage that? So I'm at UCLA and we have hugely distributed IT and not necessarily the most unified network. How do you manage that segmentation um, across such a wide surface? Yeah. Um, and, and, and not just technically, but in terms of human capital when, you know, because it seems to me that you need a lot of brain power um, and also um, some common, uh, common understandings in place, especially right. when different areas of the campus often may do different things uh, and it's hard to control and know what's going on. Um, you could have said, and I'm not saying that you that the way you asked your question, I thought was very good. I'm not criticizing it, I wanna be very clear. You could have also said, I'm at UCLA, period. How do I implement this? Because I think you know what I'm talking about because you're at UCLA. So, yes. <laughs> UCLA may be the counter example to this whole thing. Um, uh, in the case of UCLA, it's a highly distributed network. The main networking group is kind of like an ISP to a bunch of small customers. So, in that particular case, what you need is a framework not for controls to apply, but for things to look for that, you know, where's the value and where's the risk? And how do you have a common framework for assessing that? And, and again, that gets highly political really quickly. I'm not going to say this is easy. Um, but in the case of 
a school like that, the thing to try to converge on is in how you identify the risk and not a set of controls that you have to apply. And I think, I mean, one, one final sentence, and then Peter can ask a question. I think that if you do that, if you get that conversation going, you're going to get more buy-in than if you get the conversation of everyone has to have this type of device on their network. Sorry, there's a fruit fly right there. Yeah, that's <laughs> Went right in my eye. So I think that I think that's the way to do it. But yeah, I'm not going to say it's easy. Yeah, you know. I'm going to say something. That everyone's going to think. How'd the marketing guy get into this conference? But um, we have a model for what you're describing. It's called the internet. Um, I remember being told very very early on, my job is not to protect you from the internet, just to protect the internet from you. You know, I treat you as a separate entity, and I don't trust you. And da da da. da. Um, so I can't say you can do this at UCLA, but. I am designing and trying to build multiple new backbones on my campus, one of which I want to give to the students over in the cybersecurity lab. And they got a link out to the internet. It's completely off the rest of the network. Um, they can attack each other. They can open it to 20 high schools to come attack them, et cetera. And that's completely different than the production PeopleSoft network. And that's completely different from the HPC network, et cetera. And I think the model really here is each of these conceptually is a different network. And you can have a bunch of them come into the same scenic link going out break it up and, and you know have multiple links off campus or something. But I really like this model. And I, I was thinking I was going to have two or three, but I'm just getting excited here. Yeah. Well, and I, I would say that. Yep. Um, the one, I think it's a great, a great point. And one, one response I would have to it, I think, I think kind of the trap we fell into at one point was not that perimeter security was bad, but we thought there was one perimeter. We thought that the, our campus was the perimeter. And instead of having multiple perimeters from the beginning, um, which actually some of us did. I mean, when we implemented firewalls at Berkeley, um, it was every department had a firewall. So, um, you know, there are ways of doing it, but but the idea that you have one perimeter in the middle of campus kind of got us into the wrong mindset of, yeah, trusted, untrusted, walled city, you know, heathens. Right. Yeah, exactly. So. Oh, as, uh, speaking as a as a let's say network guy, um, okay. Seems like you are created you are creating um, another complexity to the internet. Um, but it would be great if you should fix something that is inside the internet itself, which is lack of availability of you know transparency over the of the of the policy. So you, you are setting set of policies in, in your own network. There is another network on the other side. There are some networks in between. And all of them have their own policies. So and, and one reason why D Science DMZ was introduced was just because or fat networks failed to deliver high, perf high performance. And one of the reasons is that their policies were not transparent. Right. So we are getting all this black holing and asymmetric routing and all this stuff. So if I'm not able to transfer my data to the other side because of someone in the, mi in the, in the middle has its own policy, it's just failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was some of the motivation also behind um, not just building science DMZs, but building collaborations of science DMZs so that you can say, okay, how do we make sure that these are talking to each other in a, in a consistent and sane way um, so that those policies are, at least, if, not, if not the same, because you might have different policies about different data, but at least you have transparency, like you said. At least we can say, here's what you can expect from our science DMZ. So in many respects, that's where like, the next step, first you had the science DMZ, then you had collaborations around the science DMZ, these sort of you know, overlays and multi DMZs and research platforms and things like that. And I think that was some of the motivation for that, exactly. Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank Michael for his presentation. <laughs> and I, I would like to thank my moderator, Tad Rinalis, who, <laughs> who told me when to start, told me when to stop. <laughs> yeah, that's right.
I have no idea. So if you just if you if you just want to, I mean, I 